Hello booktube, today I thought I would do a book review for you and this is by Ian Mortimer and it's called The Greatest Traitor and it's The Life of Sir Roger Mortimer, First Earl of March. Um, so if you're familiar with Roger Mortimer, you will know that he overthrew King Edward II um, in 1327 and became the de facto ruler himself. And when I learned about him in school, I sort of had some unanswered questions about why he acted the way he did. And I was mainly concerned with the questions surrounding why he would overthrow a tyrant just to become a dictator himself. Um, Edward II was an anointed king, meaning he was chosen by God to rule England. And, um, you know, that no one bad an eye um, at that in the medieval period. Roger was just a mere baron from the Welsh marches. Um, while there is a precedent in English history um, for nobles deposing kings, um, the example in this case being Simon de Montfort um, overthrowing Henry III during the Second Baron's War, um, it's, it was still unclear to me as to why Roger chose the path that he did. Um, so the reason why I liked this book by Anne Mortimer um, is because it was an, a balanced examination of Roger's nature and um, nurture, although a lot of the personality characteristics um, that Ian Mortimer um, projects are um, his expert opinions based on textual evidence and events. So in order to fully understand as best as we can Roger's decisions, um, Ian Mortimer um, sort of breaks up the um, the story into, you know, well, it's done in chronological order. However, I really like his examination of Roger's formative years and his relationships with others, um, as it's because it through these um, through these aspects that we can fully understand um, the path that he chose. So, um, Roger was the son of Edmund. Um, himself being um, not meant for um, lordship. Edmund was a second son, son um, destined for um, clerical duties. However, his older brother died young and Edmund was pulled out of clerical studies in Oxford and thrust into the militaristic lifestyle that defined the lifestyle of a lord in the Welsh marches at that time. So, when Roger was young, he would have heard stories as well about tales of his ancestry. He is descended from Llewellyn the Great and um, the princes of Wales in Arthurian legend, um, the descendants of these princes would, um, would one day become the King of England. So noble families in the Middle Ages placed great importance in prophecies um, and believed in them. So Roger must have accepted the magnitude of this destiny um, to some degree um, when he was younger. And this coupled with the military style lordship um, that, you know, that was meant to be his destiny. This must have had a profound, uh, a profoundly influential, um, it, it must have been profoundly influential on his personality um, during his formative years. Um, so his father is mortally wounded while Roger is still in his minority, meaning before he's 21, and Edward I, who was king at the time, places him in the guardianship of Piers Gaveston. So this is where we start to get a sense of Roger's personality through his relationships with others, and we begin to see a man who's more interested in acting um, in protecting his self-interest more so than um, acting out of morals, you know, um, sort of juxtaposing him with Simon de Montfort, who also deposed the king, um, but um, famously was, um, you know, had a strong sense of what is right and versus what is wrong, although that's, I suppose, a bit relative. Um, in any case, if we digress and look at Piers Gaveston for a second, um, this will make a bit more sense. So not only was Roger Piers' ward, they were also jousting partners. So Piers was the son of a Gascon knight, 
Um, however, through his relationship with Edward II, who became king when Edward I died, um, he wielded vast amounts of power over the other lords. And this really pissed them off because he was, you know, the mere, he was merely the son of a Gascon knight. However, Edward II was deeply distrustful of the nobles at his court, and he would often place sole trust and companionship in one individual. Um, and in this instance, it was with Piers. Piers was famously witty, charming. However, he was incredibly rude and disrespectful, and he wasn't shy about letting other people know that he didn't like them. Um, so the fact that Piers and Roger were jousting partners speaks volumes, um, and it shows that Roger was placed in the circle of trust with the king. So there's a lot of speculation regarding Piers and Edward's relationship, and, you know, some people suggest that it was more than just platonic, but regardless of this, um, their bond was very incredibly strong. Um, so much so that they weren't afraid of, you know, flaunting their relationship uh, to the point of, you know, <laughs> upsetting others um, in the court, th those with whom, you know, they, they were meant to be allying, allying themselves with. So when Isabella, um, Edward's wife and queen, traveled from France to marry Edward, she was only 12. And from this very first meeting um, at the wedding meal, um, Isabella wasn't sat next to her husband, Piers was, and she and her relatives were sort of demoted toward, down towards, you know, the end of the table. And her relatives left in immediate disgust over this treatment. Isabella was only 12 at the time, as I've mentioned, but she was a Capetian princess and she recognized the insult to her station, though she probably couldn't have seen the trouble that awaited her through this, you know, relationship. So if we flash forward a bit, um, Roger marries Joan de Jeanville and he becomes the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. He's engrossed in battles with the de Lacys, who are Joan's kin, for control of Ireland but also with Robert the Bruce's brother, Edward, who is called from Scotland um, in aid of the de Lacy's. Um, it's, you know, uh, this lieutenantship lasts for quite some time and he's in near full control of Ireland, a position that not only would have required extreme self-assurance, but also would have fostered this trait and, and you know, this belief as well. So during this period, Piers is eventually murdered by his peers and Edward is powerless to fight back. He's, you know, he's figuratively got his arms tied behind his back by powerful nobles. However, Roger and his uncle, um, also Roger Mortimer, but of Chirk, um, didn't partake in this due to their relationship with the king um, in order to preserve their own interests. If we flash forward even further still, Edward II finds a second favorite in Hugh Despenser Spencer the Younger. And this, you know, he controls access to the king as well, and he upsets Isabella in more ways than Gaveston ever could. And this is where we see the seeds of discord sown between Roger and the king being sown. So Roger despised Hugh for two reasons. Um, firstly, um, Hugh the Younger was granted lands in Wales, and in the marches that were meant to be inherited by other lords in the region with whom Roger was allied. The second reason is the murder of Llewellyn Bren by Hugh Dispenser the Younger. So despite the fact that Roger was tasked with bringing down Bren and his rebellion, um, the two become good friends and Roger ends up promising uh, to Bren that he would plead his case to the king to keep him alive. So Bren and Roger were both of princely Welsh blood, they were well learned, and they had similar interests. So it's easy to see how, you know, in spite of this, uh, these battles that they fought against each other, um, why they would have, you know, a personal relationship with each other. Um, he was eventually placed in the Tower of London. However, Hugh had him dragged out hanged, and while he was still alive, his heart and intestines were cut out and thrown in the fire. So he died a pretty brutal death, and this infuriated Roger, who um, swore that he would protect his life. 
Um, eventually war breaks out in what's known as the Dispensers War, and ultimately Roger and his uncle are captured at Shrewsbury, and Roger is sent to the Tower. After about a year, he escapes to France, and it's at this point where it's apparent that him and Isabella are more than just mere acquaintances, and they conspire to overthrow her husband. So Isabella had a deep internal struggle with um, overthrowing her husband, and we can see that she flip-flops between wanting to and not wanting to on a number of occasions. Um, she was deeply devout and believed in the sanctity of her marriage, um, and despite everything that happened, she, she did love her husband. However, when an envoy was sent to her brother, the King of France, with whom she was staying, she refused to return to her husband, stating that, you know, stating in front of the whole court that she basically declared herself a widow. Um, and, you know, she believed that this man, Hugh, came between her and her husband. Um, flashing forward even further, um, eventually, in this dispenser's war, he was captured, and Isabella, in turn, has him dragged through the streets naked, hanged, but just before he dies, has him tied to a ladder, and has his genitals cut off and burned while he has to watch, and it's symbolic of the wedge between her and her husband's marriage. So, it's at this point where um, the book receives mixed reviews, so Ian Mortimer um, proposes two different things which don't necessarily match well with other historians. However, um, you know, he puts good cases forward. So the story goes that Edward II was taken to Barclay Castle and he was eventually killed. However, Ian Mortimer suggests that Edward um, isn't murdered, but he's kept alive. And what we see is that um, there were two reasons for this, possibly. Um, Roger didn't want to upset Isabella um, by killing her husband. Um, as, as we've seen previously, she still very much loved her husband. She was very devout and, you know, didn't want him to be killed. However, um, Roger also didn't want to eventually be avenged by his son, Edward III. So it's for these two main reasons why he puts forward the argument that um, Edward II's death was staged, um, his funeral was staged, but he was kept alive in secrecy. Another argument that Ian Mortimer puts forward is um, the case that Isabella also becomes pregnant by Roger Mortimer during this, um, during this same period. So in any case, whatever happens, um, they commandeer the royal seals, and these sort of act like checks and balances um, in the Kingdom of England at this time. So um, whatever the king decreed essentially had to be, um, you know, signed off by whoever had the seals, and this sort of acted like checks and balances. However, um, by taking the seals, um, Roger effectively becomes a dictator behind the shadows for the next three years um, in all but name. He's, you know, exercising his might and his influence um, behind, the, behind the scenes and, um, you know, forcing um, Edward III to, to really make decisions that he didn't necessarily want to. And it's at this point that we not only see a self-assured Roger, but we also see an arrogant one as well. So at this point, he really starts to anger those with whom he was previously allied, and he eventually has Edward III grant him the Earldom of March, which placed him at a premier position over all of the other Marcher lords. Um, it's at this point where we also see him acting very foolishly as well. So at jousting events, he would portray himself, not Edward III, as King Arthur, and he would sit in the king's presence. So perhaps we see him, you know, placing weight in the prophecies that he would have heard as a child where, you know, regarding his ancestry. Um, or maybe he was just comfortable in his own sense of power. But in any case, it's, it was clear at this point that he was overstepping, he was overconfident, 
and his own son Geoffrey would mock his father, um, calling him the king of folly. So eventually, Roger's captured one night at Nottingham ca Castle by Edward III, and he's hanged at Tyburn, um, despite pleas from Isabella to show mercy. And, you know, this is, this is where we see that Roger has met his untimely death after three years of being a dictator. Um, so, in essence, um, I really enjoyed this book by Ian Mortimer because it answered a lot of questions that I, I necessarily couldn't find answers to just by doing um, independent research. There's not a lot of other resources on or biographies dedicated to Roger Mortimer other than this one, which is slightly disappointing. I think, you know, for instance, someone like Simon de Montfort, um, there's a lot more written about him, but that again, um, I suppose he did a lot more in terms of, you know, laying the groundwork for um, future, um, uh, I don't know, laws in, in English history. But in essence, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this book. I thought, you know, um, it was great at uh, just bringing this man to life and um, giving him depth and body that you can't get just by reading, um, you know, documents online about what's actually happened. And yeah, um, hopefully maybe you might pick this book up if you haven't already and, and maybe, um, Maybe you might have some questions in the comment section or some uh, points for discussion. So um, thanks for watching and until next time. Thank you. Bye.